Yeah, hi everybody. Thank you very much for joining me today. We're going to be taking a look at uh, lesson number three, and uh, which is an exciting beginning uh, for the permaculture design stage. Once we get our base plan in place, we can now start looking at some uh, some sectors, which is uh, again I think a really interesting part of the design process. Let's see here. Well, maybe what we'll do is I'll just share my screen. Okay. Yeah, the other thing I'll do is put the Q&A document in the chat here. If anybody wants to add to that and certainly just uh, ask a question in the chat as well or unmute yourself. So feel free as we're going along here, if there's anything that um, you don't fully understand. Okay, so let's take a look at lesson number three. So it's like many of our lessons divided up into a couple of different parts here. And initially we have a site and regional challenge survey, which I'm not really gonna spend much time on. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But uh, what I wanna do is spend a little bit of time here on the sector compass. So <clears throat> I'm sure Andrew has lots of content that you've been going through with that. Um, Again, it's a nice way to start a design. And, and traditionally what we do, my wife and myself, with our work is we'll put together our base plan. And in fact, we're at that stage with a, a new drawing. So we finish up our base plan, at least as much as we can map based on what we have. So in this particular project, it's... Uh, um, we have a drone survey giving us topographic information as well as uh, high definition images. And I'll probably just turn on my software here and show that to you a little bit later. Um, so yeah, so the next step is getting back to the site and you might find, I mean, I certainly do when I visit a project site or I'm looking at a new design, I need to, to break it out into steps. Um, otherwise it can feel, you know, almost like an overwhelming process. And I think that's one thing that the permaculture design um, protocol does really well here is it takes us through these various steps. And the first one of course is a sector compass. So what is that all about? Why are we even uh, worried about it? And um, can, I, can anybody out there today tell me why a sector compass might be um, a valuable tool going forward? And you can put that in the chat or you can unmute yourself, whatever you like. Okay. So Maggie has a comment here. You can determine the overlapping issues you have to work with. Absolutely. Uh, Sarah, fire protection or fire block. Yes, absolutely. And I think the, the big thing um, that differentiates this step in the design process is we're looking at all of these forces that are outside of the project site boundary, right? They're not things that are directly in our control. So that includes, you know, obvious things like sunshine. Uh, it may include uh, wind. Uh, it may include some neighboring properties. It um, <clears throat> could be noise, pollution. There, there, it could be a view corridor. I've certainly had uh, projects that had a beautiful view corridor and then a noise corridor and they're almost in the same vicinity. So that can get really challenging how to screen out the noise, but leave the view. 
Um, yeah, there's a few others like that, but that is the big thing and, and water, right? So water can play a huge part uh, in all of this and certainly does where I live. We get, uh, a, we have a spring that pops up right on our property line in, a, in the middle of a ditch of all places. And um, that uh, that is originating at least in part from our neighbor's property. So that's an asset even though I'm sure the, the previous uh, property owner saw it as a liability uh, because of the nature, it could flood out uh, the area during the winter. Oh. Sorry, I'm just uh, having to push a button here. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I lost a uh, view of my screen there for a second. Yeah, so again, there's all these outside forces and uh, they can be, um, they can be neutral, they could be positive, they could be kind of negative. And a good example of that is sunlight, you know, summer sunlight, maybe we're trying to avoid having sun hit our, our house in the middle of the summer. Right. Maybe in the winter, we want to bring in all that light. And it's a great example where I live. We have uh, these wonderful, um, huge windows on our southern boundary or southern part of our house. And um, that lets in lots of beautiful winter light. But then we have to think about shading that during the summer. So, again, this is uh, really a really useful exercise in that we identify these outside forces. And then we're going to look at whether we want to amplify them, uh, we want to deflect them or accept them. So we're going to look at not only the force, but you know the action. What are we going to potentially do with these through our design? Yeah, and this is a great starting point. And it's certainly something we, um, when we put together the sector compass for our uh, our clients will then show it to them and make sure that's in sync with what uh, they envision on their site. And we uh, will often be referencing this during the design process uh, just to make sure we stay on target here. So a couple other things that we want to consider, like with most of the assignments, you know, we want to have a title block that's consistent. And uh, we can bring up that template file and take a look at an example here. Then I'll show you what uh, some of the deliverables that uh, my wife and myself provide, and it'll be a little bit different, but it's the same idea. So that's an example of a sector compass. It might be called the sector map. And here is uh, one of those examples. So we have a a shot of the base plan and that has been reduced in size quite a bit so that we can uh, envision these sectors around the whole property boundary. So try and make sure that we can see the whole property boundary when you stick your base map uh, in the middle of this. We don't need it to be that large because this is sort of a macro view. Uh, we're looking at generally where these different sectors uh, enter the, the project site. And this gives us a really good idea. So we can see the summer and the winter um, pattern or, or sun path, right? Um, and one thing I am going to show you There's a fantastic app. Not, I'm sure it's on um, uh, Androids as well, but I have an iPhone. So I use Sunseeker, and that is a fantastic app for your phone. It um, We've used this for years, and it is just super helpful in many, many ways. You can view your project site in many different uh, modes. Uh, the one really interesting one here is when it's an augmented reality. So you can actually uh, 
take the um, take the phone, take your camera, and point it up into the sky, and it gives you the path during uh, solstices uh, on the given day. And this is very very handy when you're trying to locate, you know, places in your landscape or your project site that have high levels of light. You know, where's the best place to um, put a greenhouse. Now we've lived on our property 27 years. And when we look at things like that, we still bring out our sun seeker just to verify it because it's, you know, we may decide, Oh, well, these get the same amount of light, but this area here gets a little, uh, light later in the day. And we're hoping to, that, uh, fall crops that we're putting here are, would benefit from that. So there's a lot of really cool things about this app. So I would, definitely recommend that when we're <clears throat> looking at sun sectors. Now that's not the tool that we're recommending you use when you grab uh, grab this, I believe it's called there's a couple that are out there in data. So there we are, sun calc. So this is pretty easy to use. I don't know if anybody has tried it out, but I'll just uh, type in my rough location here. And this is the type of uh, format we're going to get. So we have to change the dates here. That's the only thing. So if we want to look at... Um, Let's say we want to look at that winter. There we go. So this angle here, we're we're north up on the map. So another advantage to having your base plans north up. Uh, you can basically take this this angle here, and let me just uh, there we go. So if you replicate this this sun path and put that on your base plan. That is your winter uh, winter path. And then, of course, you just have to change the date here to June. And should be in and around the 21st. I did an update. Hmm. That's uh, unusual. I'm not sure why that is not updating. There we go. So that's May. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's not working. Hmm. But I think you get the gist of it. Um, this would be closer to our summer path. Uh, and it's basically taking these angles and transposing those onto your drawing. So that's pretty easy. <clears throat> when you're in the field, uh, the Sun Seeker is really, really helpful. All right. So let us take a look at, if we look at these examples, it does give us an idea of what sort of sectors we may be looking at or looking for. Um, if we're on acreage, you know, you may have a fire sector. So if you're in an urban environment, it, it's unlikely that that's really going to be a case. Um, there's a slight possibility, but it's, you know, you think about uh, urban areas and just the level of fire protection. Uh, if Even if a fire broke out on a neighbor's property, odds are you're going to have a fire department there pretty quick. So the fire sector in an urban area, you know, maybe doubt it. Because uh, what we're trying to do here is identify these sectors. But not only that, we want to figure out, okay, if, if we have an acreage site and we have a fire sector, how are we going to move forward with our design uh, with that in mind? How are we going to create some protection from that or deflect it? 
Um, or maybe in the case of the winter sun, how are we going to accept and amplify that onto our site or into a given area? And you could go through here and look at the same. So you have visit, might have a visitor sector, an entry to your property, wildlife, you know, that may be in part of the areas. It may be through your whole site. Um, in this case, we have smoke um, and noise and crime. And we have pleasant and unpleasant views. So you may not have this many sectors. Um, you may have quite a few less, you never know. So don't feel like you have to have that many. Uh, here's another example where there's, you know, quite a few less. And this is an acreage property and you'll notice that their fire sector, they've identified uh, in one area here rather than the whole property. So this is quite well done. And then you just look at how much information is on one sheet. You know, not only do we have all the sectors, the actions, you have uh, some nearby um, locations to reference, right? A gas station nearby, a fire station, some markets. So there's quite a bit of info all in, wrapped up into that sheet. It's quite amazing. So if you can... You want to try and get all your info on one page, right? Because again, the actual details of the base plan are not that important. It's more of uh, this sort of macro um, macro image. So yeah, so hopefully that makes uh, sense to everybody. Um, yeah, and then again with the rubric, just make sure you go through and take a look at the rubric here. This is what I use to grade your papers. So as long as you have completed all of these, you'll be in good shape. And of course, there's some resources here you can check out. Yeah, does anybody have uh, any questions at all regarding the sector compass? Happy to answer that. If anybody's got any, I've got a couple examples here I can show you. All right. Well, if it uh, actually, what I should do, just take a look at the that Google document, make sure I'm not missing a question here. Yeah, we looked at that last week or two weeks ago. Okay. Oh. So Maggie's got a question. How far around or how big do you know how to make each sector compass line? Right. So you're saying, so the noise coming off the road, it's a very lin a linear road. You want to start and end. I'll show you what I do with that. Um, maybe what I'll do, I'll bring up one of my examples here, Maggie. To make it a little bit easier. Okay. So when I'm doing sector compass work, I look at it very much in a circular pattern, even though the property is rectangular. Uh, and really this is visualization, right? So, and it doesn't have to be well, I shouldn't say it doesn't have to be precise. You want it to represent what's going on. But what I typically do is I'll go to the middle of the drawing. So let's say it's somewhere in here. And uh, I can't really show you my work, but I these are all, all begin their life as circles, right? So from a, a central point, and then I will figure out how far along 
this is actually the case. So in this case, the noise and pollution covers, maybe what I'll do, I'll just change pencil, there we go. So in this case, the pollution and the noise are, are coming at the house and property like that. And that's how I depict it in that circle, even though it's much like you've described, uh, it's quite linear. There's a, in the fact, in this case, there's, uh, there is a highway <laughs> just out here, a berm and a highway, and then a view, right? So there's this beautiful view and there's this horrendous noise. And uh, so that's how we would uh, show that. Just uh, let me get rid of this. And then I would say the thing, it would be the same for, let's say, the prevailing wind. So we got some historical charts, and we figured out the wind was coming from this direction. So that's the wind that we would want to try and uh, uh, block during the winter. I see I've got a question here. So Maggie's commenting. So it's just how big you decide to make the radius. Right. That's right. And that um, in, in somewhat dictated by how many sectors you have and shrinking the base plan to try and fit uh, inside of this. So I hope that makes sense. How big you decide. Yeah. So I just try and make it clear as possible. Um, this is kind of typical. If if this was a hundred acre site, let's say, then you know, you 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 wouldn't be viewing a lot of detail on the base plan, but you again have that macro image of energies that are affecting the project site. So hopefully that uh, makes some sense there. Yeah. So I hope that makes sense, Maggie. Uh, if not, let me know. I'm happy to take another look at it. In fact, maybe what we'll do is just look at that example that I had up. And this is a project site. Um, hmm. That's interesting. There's a couple of projects here. <laughs> So uh, this is one off of a, a job we did locally. So it had a flood sector. And how did we know that? Well, we had quite a bit of uh, slope. You can see the contour lines here. We had quite a bit of slope coming from the, the west side here. And um, it went up into a forested area. And we actually... Uh, and we're going to go through this when we do this. And oh, it's the wrong file. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that shouldn't be on there. So there we go. So that is the correct sector compass for this project. And you can see a couple things. I'm not completely north up here, right? Which I should be. Uh, and I have winter and summer sun. I have some flood sector here, privacy. There's a view corridor and, and then wildlife. So there's not a whole, there's no fire. This is in a city location. Um, so this is kind of our starting point. And the project's right here. And then... We can do uh, any number of things. Sometimes we'll just do a little bit of a description up top here. And in this case, we we did a little chart where we have the various sectors and how we're going to use those. So with wildlife too, 
you know, you, you have to define wildlife. Um, in this case, we want to protect uh, from deer pressure, but we also want to uh, allow other types of wildlife uh, access. So, yeah, so that um, that's one way you can set up your drawing. Uh, again, this is one we did. It's pretty simple. And we try and do uh, make sure there's, again, this title block, north arrow, a scale bar. Um, and then what I can do, I can just show you a couple of items here. So on this job, what we did was we started with the water layer, right? That's the first thing we look at. And this will be, you know, this is how we kind of cherry pick what we feel uh, is really important from the from culture design process, from the agrarian platform, from other design. Um, you know, started out our day with traditional landscape design. That's what I uh, was trained in and grew up with. And then we've integrated these other ecological systems, uh, ecological design systems. And so this is kind of where uh, we have got with things where uh, A, after a sector compass, we're looking at water. And this is small, quite a small lot. Um, and we just figured out how much water pressure we had from a neighboring property. So this is what we call the micro watershed. And we're going to get into that in lesson five, um, where we try and uh, calculate how much water can potentially uh, run on to our project sites, right? Unless we're at the very top of a watershed, odds are you're going to have some potential pressure on your site. And that's a really useful exercise to go through. So if we go back to this property and it has a flood sector, uh, I don't have that uh, file handy with me, but we did a micro watershed calculation and it was enormous, right? Um, so we knew if we're in this job, we were taking out an existing retaining wall and replacing it, we know that we're going to have a lot of water, a potential water pressure uh, right along here. This is where this existing retaining system is. And that's what uh, ended up getting removed and redesigned. Um, but knowing we had this pressure was vital because in the summer, we did this preparation and, and the wall construction, and it was dry as a bone. And as soon as we hit the middle of winter, there was quite a flow of water going through this area. And it would have been hard to predict that uh, otherwise. So these, uh, these things can be very, very helpful in uh, forecasting, uh, you know, some stormwater challenges that, again, we turn into an asset. So all this water that got ended up getting collected behind the new retaining wall ended up going into a rain garden in the front of the house here. So we we're able to re-infiltrate that water, but just kind of pull it around the house. We don't want it uh, putting pressure up to the house or the new wall that's here. So yeah, so this is a water layer for this particular project, a little a uh, bit of roof surface and, you know, we, we just calculate how much water is going to hit that and uh, annual average, based on annual average rainfall. And uh, yeah, and then we start thinking about what we can do with that. <clears throat> and again, in urban situations, we're, we're often trying to um, implement rain gardens. Because <clears throat> more often than not, we're dealing with asphalt shingle roofing, and that does limit what we can do with the water once it comes off the roof. We don't want to store that and place it on annual edibles, right? That would be a mistake. Um, the, the asphalt shingle roofing is going to have fire retardants and hydrocarbons and 
all sorts of nasty things that get pulled up into annual vegetables. And uh, so you, you want to avoid that. Um, but uh, uh, rain gardens are a fabulous uh, alternative. And let me just show you one thing here. Back to this, and there's this excellent rain garden uh, resource here. If you just Google rain garden handbook for Western Washington, uh, it's almost a hundred page guide and it is fantastic. It's one of the best guides I've uh, found out there. Uh, this really helped the, with me with the first one that I installed. Uh, see a really good overview and one of the key things at the end here is this plant list so you have in a rain garden you have different zones that you're dealing with not to be confused with permaculture zones um, but these are distinct zones in a rain garden and uh, they're listed one through three and we're not gonna get too deep into this today um, but the reality is zone one is the bottom. So it's an area that gets flooded and can, and, uh, can go through quite a bit of drought during the summer. Uh, zone two is this edge here that's sort of in this nomad, you know, it's in between, uh, it, it get, might get partially flooded. And then the top area here. Uh, right up here would be zone three, and this is actually more of a zero scape area. It's well above uh, the flood line, and it um, you want to be selecting plants that are going to be appropriate here. So zone one is very different than zone three, and that again is one of the beauties of this guidebook. If we go to the end where we're looking at plants. You can see some plants will do well in anything <laughs> and others are quite specific. So this is a great, uh, a great guidebook, even if you're not in Western Washington and I don't uh, live there myself, but it is a very good general um, book. And leading up into lesson number five, when we are looking at um, uh, water and it entering our project site, we want to start thinking about what can we do with this water and uh, this is a wonderful way of dealing with it in an urban uh, urban setting okay so i think we have gone through that all yeah okay so let me just um go over and share that uh, file we were looking at. I can just give you a quick shot of uh, the deliverables. Anyways, this is a, 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 without getting into it too deeply, this is our water layer. So <clears throat> we do our base plan and our sector analysis, sector compass, and then we're, we meet with our clients, usually online, uh, very quickly, just say, hey, this is what we've come up with. Is this what you see? Like, yep. Then we go to the water layer, and then we'll do the same thing. We'll have a meeting with them after we accomplish this work and wait for feedback. You know, we might get it, we might not. Um, and then we go to the, our next layer. So all of these layers build on top of each other, and the water layer being, you know, the biggie. Uh, then we go into access which is how we move through the site. Uh, and in, in this case, really the access uh, was all about creating a walkway to a proposed building and a little uh, covered um, cooking area and entertaining area. Um, so, so again, that's water and access. And then when we get to soil, 
which is um, you know a layer that a lot of us are really interested in the all about plants uh, that overlays the first two layers so we prioritize the water and the access and then we drop the the plants in and the planting areas in almost like it's icing on the cake uh, and they of course um we're going to soften so we're softening and enclosing patio surfaces uh, we have annual vegetables here this was part of the deal and a food forest planting so quite a wide variety of plants in here and then all of these layers make up the concept and this is what you'll find when you get to the end of the course in the final design it is a conceptual design you're doing so we're not really uh, at this point we're not looking at fine details on all of the plants that are here we just know generally these are trees shrubs and perennials um, that comes later for ourselves we then start getting into more of the specifics uh, with our planting plans here and uh, here we have these are perennial plantings um, this is an overall and this is the tree and shrub so we like to kind of split that up so that we have a really good idea of our you know of our structure so uh, in the winter or the dormant season the tree and shrub structure is going to hold the show so to speak and um, by Kind of separating these a little bit it helps us uh, ensure that we have a good balance um, and then we have a little plant list that gets generated from uh, these two design sheets so and then we do details so there's a few details on the patio and this uh, covered area that they're gonna put a little roof and collect water off of and then there's just a very tiny rain garden here uh, and a little swale trail that'll pick up uh, surges of water from the neighbors. So this is kind of typical of what, uh, you know, a package that we would provide to a client. So again, those separate layers. Um, yeah, we've got all kinds of stuff we can show you through the course here. And let me see. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to show you what we're working on right now. I'll just get the file loaded here. Okay, there we are. All right. Uh, yeah, this is the base plan we're just working on right now. And uh, let me show you. Of course, this is, you know, it's only going to make sense to a point because we're working on software that you're not. And um, we can turn things on and off here. Uh, I think what we'll do. And uh, just turn a few of these. Yeah, so we get this is kind of typical how we can start a drawing. We'll get these. Um, this uh, is a drone survey, and we don't do our own. Um, you could. But that's the image that gets stitched together. And then we get 
um, we get what's called uh, a point cloud uh, data, and then we can create this contour map uh, of the site. And uh, so we can show others here so we know where we're at. Uh, we might not want that on right now. And then, yeah, we just start to build the uh, the base plan off of all that mapping. So up to now, we've gone to the site, we've done a proposal and we got the job. And then we had our drone surveyor out there taken, uh, doing a survey and sent us the file. So we haven't actually been on the site to document anything yet. And this is kind of where our base plan is. We need to know uh, a number of different things, uh, but we have our tree. That's kind of what we're showing existing trees. And these are neighboring trees. Um, and so plan is next week, we're gonna go take some measurements and start getting a little more detailed about uh, some of the aspects of the site here. And we can turn that on. Because uh, if we go in, you can see the resolution is quite good here. If you, if you end up getting high definition images, uh, you can see individual rocks here. There's this little body of water. So it's fantastic for, um, for mapping. Now, the trees don't help, but this is a LIDAR. Um, Okay, hold on here. Maggie's got a question. Uh, so Maggie's wondering, is this data vector is able to pull on? To, is it its own or do you have to pull that into the program? Yes, that's right. So the drone surveyor will go out and survey the property, take all these images, they get stitched together. This is just a whole bunch of images to a reference together. And then he does uh, also takes um, uh, LIDAR data, which we can then, we can, nice thing about LIDAR is we can uh, exclude the tree canopy and it'll just look at the ground. Um, and then we're able to get accurate contours. So we take his data and we input it, uh, and this is what we are able to get from it. So we get a nice photo. Let me just uh, show you here. And then we create a site model, uh, which is this. And these are one foot contours, even though they have funny, you know, it's 27.432, because it's all metric, but these are one foot. And um, yeah, this is uh, absolutely what we need <laughs> to get going. So we just know where the water is going to be moving through the site here. Um, so yes, you have to. Now, if, if we, and I've done this before, um, we can get LiDAR data from a portal online. So I could get this data for free, but I, I needed to have a geo-referenced image as well. So this was the best uh, approach. It's hard to have one without the other. Uh, Google Earth is not um, current or accurate enough to give us higher resolution images like this. So uh, yeah, you gotta, it, it's a little bit of a process to go that route to take to grab the lidar data yourself, but uh, fortunately we're able to do that. It's not an easy thing to learn, but you know it, it's um, it's very useful. There's no doubt of that. Uh, but it takes a long time to to learn it. That's the downside of it. But this gives us a lot of power. I mean, we know now where. Uh, as of this date, when the drone survey was done, these contours are accurate. That's the di disadvantage of a portal. If we go in and we 
uh, grab a file. Uh, I could get where I live, I could get the file for here. Um, and as long as there hasn't been any disturbance, major disturbance since the imagery, and it might be three, four, or five years old, that's the only thing you have to factor in. So uh, in here, this the imagery for this project may have predated the house, so it might not have worked too well. Um, but yeah, mapping is such a big part of this whole process. And it makes the designing way easier, uh, the better your mapping is. So now we haven't done, got a few minutes left here. Um, I'll just see if I can find another. Yeah, I'll just see if I can find another uh, file here. On, uh, that has a sector compass done. Yeah, just load up here. Okay, and this is an acreage project. We same idea. We had a lidar, a drone survey, and um, uh, we used the drone survey to help us map the site here. And we got contours. Uh, we can turn that off. I'm not sure. I haven't opened this file for a little while. There we go. We can take a look at our sectors. No, they're not showing up. I'll have to find them here. Interesting. Okay, I will find it somewhere else here. Sorry, the, the downside of this software is there's uh, so many ways to skin a cat, so to speak. Um, there we go. So there's another sector compass. So that was what the project we we're just looking at. So we we got the um we got the base plan together. This this took hours just to do the base plan. It was a combination of uh, the drone survey and then a lot of on-site documentation. So well, when you get into bigger sites. You may be quite shocked at how much time on-site mapping takes you and uh, it can be quite um, quite tricky. This one was, we, we slightly underestimated that, I think. Uh, but here you, you can see we've got a fire sector, we've got flood sector, so we have water pressure. This is a really interesting uh, project site here. Okay, I see I got a question I'll get to right in the two seconds here. Uh, interesting flood sector in that water can get across the street here under some culverts. And then right here is about the lowest point in the watershed. So there's nowhere. And then the, the ground goes up uh, to this barn area and stuff. And this is a low point and there's nowhere for the water to go. So it's very, very tricky uh, little area. And it, because of this, the, the pasture is quite degraded and uh, fairly poor. So 
again, this is a helpful process to go through here. So again, we got privacy, wind, fire and flood and wildlife, wildlife everywhere. Uh, and then our summer and winter sun path. So uh, Balin's got a question here. Before you were able to get drone surveys, right? Would you just use publicly available info? No, I never use Google Earth. Uh, what I would do <clears throat> before the day of drone surveys is we would get, um, we would start with a, a legal document, like a plot plan or a survey. Um, let's see if I have one here. I can show you. It basically shows the building. Oh, I think I do have one here. Okay. Uh, that's what I would start with, right? So here is one of the projects we're doing. Here is the uh, legal plot plan. Now, if you're lucky, you get a building footprint inside of it. Uh, in this case, you have a septic field, which that's pretty good, <laughs> but it's better when you have both because otherwise the property boundary, you can't relate it to anything other than this curb and roundabout. Uh, so yeah, you want a building footprint in here as well. And that's what we typically uh, started with. We would start with that and then we'd be on site triangulating existing trees and um pathways and patios whatever was there driveway and you just start building your base plan from scratch rather than any imagery so it wasn't easy uh it would take quite a bit of time but that's just the way it is so it, it's actually way more cost effective for our clients now just to uh, pay for a survey and you know they're probably in and around a thousand dollars for maybe, you know, four or five acre project, um, which isn't too bad. It, it sure makes life a whole lot easier for us. So um, I know a few people that have their own drones and do that, but in Canada, you got to have your pilot's license or some silly thing. Um, it made it difficult for people to operate their own uh, drones. So um, so Balin's got another question. Um, same with contour lines, just by your own measurements. Uh, no, let's go back to, I don't know if I got the file still open. Yep. So all of these, this gets a little trickier now. <laughs> uh, but all of these, hold on here, I just got to update the map. There we go. Uh, this is, all these contours are what's called geo-referenced. And the same with the photo. So they're inseparable. You drop it into the drawing and this is where it'll land. And up top here, you can see uh, the coordinates. In fact, if, if we do a stake object um, somewhere in the middle of this roundabout, it'll tell me roughly where we are located. And um, oh, uh, Yes, yeah, so it's geo-referenced. Um, let me, uh, I'll, I'll show you something might be a little bit easier to understand here. I'll just show you this other software we're using and then we'll wrap up today. Get away from that. Yeah, you could spend a lot of time just uh, learning about softwares, but as you, you know, when I started designing uh, landscapes, 
Um, <laughs> they were just small little areas. And then over time it grew. So it made more sense to, to get uh, into different types of softwares to help. Um, but I didn't start that way. And um, yeah, it's good to take it slow and easy. Uh, here, I'll just show you this and then we'll, we'll wrap her up. So another thing we use, it's called QGIS. And I, I won't get into that today. Um, it's not a very easy software to use. But um, what it is, let's see if I can. Let's see here. We're actually looking at properties right now to purchase. And uh, this is part of our process of going through them as um, we, lie, we get LiDAR data and start to look at, um, the, here's a property that has a boundary around it right here. And we have um, a relief map, get rid of this one. All this data is free, so I haven't had, uh, here's contours. I think these are half meter contours. Um, so to answer your question, it's all uh, geo-referenced. So all these contours, all the these, this picture here, this is a Google Earth image, right? That's all geo-referenced. So if I, uh, I've created the contours and I drop it into this uh, site here, boom. I don't position it, it positions itself. Um, so whether it be the boundary, the contours, there's all sorts of things we can do. Uh, I can put in the sort of flow map, uh, the slope map. So this tells us the slope of the land. Uh, this is being quite flat and this is a little bit of erosion or activity going on this edge. So I won't go uh, any further into that. I see I've got a couple questions and then I'm going to have to call her a day here. Uh, so Maggie's question. Uh, so georeferencing occurs. <clears throat> yeah, that's quite right. Uh, like it would take a little while, but um, let's say where I'm looking at here, this is in actually Nova Scotia. It's nowhere even near where I live. <laughs> We're just looking at property there. It's on the East coast of Canada. And I can go on to a, a website and I can get LIDAR data for the whole province. Uh, which I do, I grab pieces if we're interested in uh, something. And, um, but it is georeferenced. The data is georeferenced and then it gets pulled into this real world situation here. Um, and it also gets, um, yeah, it links, everything links up together. So I can't change any of that. Yeah, I have to go with it. You just have to make sure you've got all the boxes ticked correctly. And the same with vector words. So QGIS is is fine. You you drop stuff in and work with it, and you're all good. Uh, in vector works, you have to change a lot of settings to make it work. It's rather quite uh, nasty that way. But but on larger properties, uh, you start getting into this type of stuff, and it gives you a lot more control of um, of everything. You know, we can see uh, in this particular situation, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but you can actually see ATV trails being cut through this land. This is about a hundred acres. So we can also, uh, if we go to, I think 
that's the wrong one. Go to contours here. We can see where there's water coming down. This looks pretty good here. So we're looking for spots, maybe micro hydro might work. We've got it here. We have some fresh water here. So again, it's a, it's a great tool. Tells you a lot even before visiting a site, um, you know, what you can expect. So yeah, I hope I didn't uh, confuse anybody with <laughs> some of the content. It's just good to, uh, I think, uh, to try and keep as broad a perspective as possible. And, you know, you may never use these softwares, but at least, uh, you know, they're out there so that if you're, you know, if your work gets more advanced and you need to have more, <clears throat> uh, tools under your belt, there, there are lots of good, good ones out there. Um, that's a couple. So. Yeah, so hopefully that uh, helps everybody out. Uh, any other questions before we sign off here today? Oh, thank you, Marina. That's great. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about anything. I've uh, and mapping. I do love that. So um, yeah, we'll see what we come up with in our next uh, next Q and A Zoom meeting. I'm not sure what that'll be, but we'll, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to write some questions about QGIS. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there are plenty. And the one unfortunate part about it is it's not really intuitive. Um, and I had to, uh, to learn via an online course through the agrarian platform, but it, it's not easy to learn. Um, but I, I know just enough to get by <laughs> for what we do, but yeah. Anyhow, thanks very much everybody for, uh, all your kind words and, uh, certainly look and good questions and look forward to, um, seeing your work next week. And yeah, if you run into any trouble, just, uh, drop me a note and I'll do everything I can to help you out. So have a great week and take care.